Welcome to Secure Talk, a podcast for security news, innovation, and excellence. Secure Talk is brought to you by StrikeGraph, a complete security compliance management solution that powers trust in the B2B marketplace. Find out more at strikegraph.com. Hey, Justin, how are you today? Great. Uh, it's good to uh, be back on the podcast, Mark. That's right. I mean, this is your third time to be on the Secure Talk podcast. Uh, congratulations. I think that is a first in the uh, record of the Secure Talk podcast. I expect like the SNL jacket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It's uh, it, the checks in the mail, man. Hey, um, this, uh, this is a pretty special episode for me because one, I mean, you know, you, this will be your third time on the podcast, but two, we're doing a handover here. We're going to pass the baton. And uh, for our listeners, let, let them know we're going to be talking about the fact that the uh, the leadership of the Secure Talk podcast is uh, being transferred. And Justin, who is the CEO of StrikeGraph, um, and has, as I said, has been on the show a couple times in the past, has stepped up and um, decided to take over the uh, the, the operations and, and running and the ownership of Secure Talk. So, Justin, uh, first off. Thank you for being on the show again, but also thank you for uh, keeping Secure Talk going. Uh, it's it's a real treat, actually. Um, I've always enjoyed being a guest. Um, I'm a rabid podcast listener. I actually spend a lot of time and find it incredibly informative on a really broad set of topics. You know, my my genres in my podcast app are like science and history and things <laughs> like that, and a little bit of business stuff. And so I think the opportunity to just contribute to the conversation away was really exciting. And we really are ecstatic to build on top of the great work that you've done, Mark, and, you know, the audience that has enjoyed um, the conversations you've had and, you know, keep it rolling forward. So thank you, actually, for giving me an opportunity uh, to really um, build on top of this. It's, it's going to be super exciting. Well, I'm I'm just really happy that we're gonna you know keep the keep the ball rolling. I, I think we've done 163 episodes. This should be the 164th episode, and um, there's there, it, you know it's amazing to me because when I when I started this back in I think it was 2000 early 2018, I I did it because I was starting I was working for a, a Microsoft cybersecurity and compliance partner, and I wanted to I wanted to learn more about cybersecurity, and I had no idea at that time the 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 breadth and the depth of cybersecurity and what it means. And over the last four and a half years, I've spoken to so many different people who are coming at this problem from so many different angles, right? And so many different perspectives, right? And, you know, it's not just all about intrusion detection or, you know, education or physical security. There are so many different elements to this and different tools and processes and, and, and so on. So it's it's really been a, a fascinating learning journey for me. Um, and so I think like we always think about a podcast as, you know, as a, as a listener, what you're learning, but as somebody who's producing it, I mean, I, I, I feel like I, I went back to school. I think it's that inquisitive mind that has made it such an interesting uh interesting set of topics, you know, you as a host is um, really inspiring to me because it is that kind of like, I want to learn. I've been, I'm inviting people in to come help me grow in the process of being a great host. I really appreciate that, that breadth of the conversation around security, right? Like um, I think I too, even in, in my career as a chief technology officer, tended to think of security as definitely a very cybersecurity thing. Like what's the firewall that we've implemented or do we have encryption? Sure. But when you think about the impact of, of security practice in any organization, you know, you're talking everything from financial fraud uh, through to intellectual property theft to, yeah, you know, data and privacy. And it, it's, it's almost like a layer on a business, like a software layer. Like we have the data layer and we have the business logic layer and we have the front end. It's like security is part of the operations that has to be not only a division in an organization, but the larger organization. And, you know, obviously it impacts national governments and the institutions inside those governments. It's just a very a broad set of thoughts. Yeah. 
It is. And, and I want to come back to that a little bit later. Um, but maybe before we do that, so our listeners can understand, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about Strike Graph and w- the perspective that you're coming at security from. And, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about, you know, your plans for uh, taking Secure Talk to the next level. Yeah, I, I got really intrigued in security um, about four and a half years ago. So my background, I, I've been building startups and companies um, now I'm getting old, so since like 98, <laughs> 99, um, a lot of failures, but a couple of good successes over the years that has been a lot of fun. I've always played the role as either a CTO or a CEO, um, but some form of uh, founder uh, support for building an organization. And about four years ago, I, I was helping build an AI company in the Seattle, Washington area. And our target market were Fortune 50 businesses at the time. And to Mm -hmm. run that product, we required a lot of employee data. And our customers uh, started really pausing adoption. uh, And they would ask us about these security credentials that I hadn't really heard of before. Um, SOC 2, ISO 27001. And I was like, well, wait a second. You know, mostly I get asked, do we have good security? And I say, yes. And you guys are yes. pretty cool with that. <laughs> this is very Times are changing. Times are changing. That's right. This is very different. And I noticed that all my colleagues and peers, you know, working on powerful technologies were getting impacted by the same questions. I was ready to start a new, um, a new venture. Uh, was and, and so I thought, this is a great problem for me to go after. I have a, a practical application to this area. Uh, in large ontological data sets and standards management. I've uh, written a paper about standards management and uh, canonical learning around standards management. And so um, uh, that's that's what inspired me to found StrikeGraph. And what StrikeGraph does, and I'm the CEO and founder of the company, is that we measure security. So we help our customers identify the right security practices, make sure they're operationalized, collect the evidence of those security practices. And then our system will take you to a SOC 2 audit or ISO 27001. That, that's a measurement. We support probably, I think, 10 or 12 different um, standards, security standards or privacy standards at this point. And so that's been my perspective on security. Like what's what's really pragmatic and practical security? And then how do I turn that security into a true asset around the business? Well, that's a, and I think measurement is an asset. And that's, that's the way I kind of describe it. Like a lot of these audits, standards, certifications, these are measuring tools for security practices. Back, back in the day at British Telecom, we were like, oh, you did good security if you didn't get a breach that year. <laughs> no, right. I think it's great. Well, if, you, if you weren't aware of the fact that you had been breached. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. No. If you did, then you I needed to ask for more problem. budget, right? Like you didn't you right. didn't get enough budget in the door. So well, so, so how were these uh, metrics being measured before? Yeah. yeah because I'm assuming there's a, there's a level of automation into in, in, in StrikeGrass platform. Um, so, so what was the old practice and in, in, in what's different now? Yeah. I, I mean, I want to highlight that just the, the act of measurement in the last five years has been a, a big innovation. I mean, I think there were things like, you know, the National Institute of Science and Technology created the NIST standard a while ago. And if you wanted to work with the CIA, of course, you know, there, there were, there was an assessment methodology, like they were going to test companies that might do that type of work or inside the government, there were tests of effective practices. Um, but it's pretty lightweight. You know, I, I remember the days when we would get asked, like, did you meet a server configuration? So is there a point solution? So right. just in the last five years, that's a big shift where we're like, hey, no, we're we're requiring some assessment of your broad security practices, not just cybersecurity, um, at an organization before we're willing to share data with you. Now, of course, what we think about is um, the way that that has been accomplished is typically with a person clicking through a spreadsheet, looking at like a screenshot, a set of configurations, a signed policy, items like that to say, oh, yes, you did this security throughout the year. It works much like a financial audit, right? Like the, the financial yeah. auditor is reviewing that history. That, there's a lot of inaccuracy to that, you know, because it's very opinion driven. And mm-hmm. that was one of my frustrations in looking at the market. And so where StrikeGraph 
uh, I think and where I'm passionate about what we do and what technology can do is I want a more accurate test. A more accurate test is repeatable with the same outcome. That's, that's the, that's the, you know, like if I'm di- right. designing an assessment system, that's what I want to see every time. And so, uh, we, we have been, uh, collecting a lot of data and developing in-house AI models to essentially automate those assessments. Yeah. I think we, you know, just as an example, we've delivered 175 audits and certifications in the last year at StrikeGraph and we did zero 24 months ago. So, yeah. Well, that's amazing. Um, you touched on it earlier that <clears throat> you, you can turn security into an asset uh, as opposed to just a cost or preventative measure. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, in, in the five years ago, when we didn't do these types of assessments, we just go through a lot of like qualitative questionnaires about like, do you do this? And we would self-assess, you know, as whether or not we did. Um, but just like a, like a college degree, you know, when you get that diploma, it's representative of a bunch of years of time spent learning, training, being assessed by mentors and experts in that field. Um, and so that, um, that particular diploma or degree is an asset in, in the marketplace of right. getting a job. Same thing with these audits and certifications. When you get a third party to perform an assessment of your security practices, that asset can drive trust really quickly. Right. And that, it's that trust that matters to close the deal, you know, to participate in the marketplace. And so that's, that's why these, and we... I have a term for them. I call them trust assets. So you have your SOC 2 audit. That's a trust asset. That's going to help you win a deal, you know, maybe yes or no. We, we I've definitely talked to a lot of folks that are like, I can't win this deal without it. Uh, but even on the flip side, it may reduce your time to close by half or two thirds because you can easily move through that procurement team's review of your security practices. Yeah. One of the companies I work with, MemoQ, um, they are a... Uh, SaaS platform that provides a solution, pretty niche, but it's for the uh, the translation or localization industry. And we do a lot of work with companies in the regulated industries, so financial services and life sciences. We also work with some government entities in, in North America, uh, U.S. and Canada. Some of the deals, if you don't have, for example, SOC 2 or certain ISO uh, credentials, it's just a non-starter. You're not going to get the business. You're not even allowed to bid on the business, right? So, um, and then if you you can map it back and say how much how much business did we win because we had that and our and our competitors didn't because we're one of the few um, companies in our space that actually have achieved some of these credentials, and sometimes that is the uh, the deal maker or breaker. So it's definitely for us we look at it as a, as a I like the, what you said a trust asset, but it's definitely an asset. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly you can imagine on the buyer side, right? Like if you're a, a buyer and you're going to get measured on picking good vendors in some way and you're risk averse, <laughs> you know, and yeah. and something does go wrong. You're like, well, but I checked. They had an industry accepted third party assessment of their practices. What more do you expect me to do? I, I think would be the excuse. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, well, in, in your space, so where do you see it going over the next couple of years? Um, is it is it just going to be the 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 abil- ability to kind of automate the the, the testing, or is it going to be um, more companies and entities are going to require these credentials in order to do business with them? Is it a combination of both? Or- you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so our research is pointing out that the the market spend on non-financial audits and audit services has been growing at about 15% over the last decade and shows no sli- signs of slowing down. So there's going to be more and more requirements in the marketplace for people to meet standards. And not just one, but what we're seeing is that multiple standards are coming into play. So you know, let's say you've built a product and you're going in to sell it to banks. Um, and so now these banking institutions are like, hey, I want to see you have this standard. And but then you decide <laughs> that same product has a fit in the medical marketplace, you know, at clinics. 
now all of a sudden you've got to be HIPAA compliant too. And so what's also metastasizing is the number of standards that become a requirement for appropriate operations. Yeah. So, um, well, that looks, that looks good for you. I and um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm just curious uh, because, you know, you did mention AI earlier in terms of uh, your, I think you were working with an AI startup. Um, I, how is AI affecting your solution or not affecting your solution? In, in a big way. And so I'll start off by saying that, like, um, I've been working on this, uh, these types of AI products back when we called it algorithmic programming. So it, it's been a, a long time. Um, in, in, a, in a prior career, I, I did a lot of work in the education technology space. And content management and understanding natural language processing was a big part of a lot of the innovation that we worked on. And we apply, I've applied those lessons in every startup I've worked at. And today, I think about it like a, a software layer. You have to have a database. You need to have a business logic layer. What is your AI layer? You know, nom de jour uh, uh, of those sure. types of technologies. Um, certainly in our space, uh, the one of the things that's important to understand is that this is complex. It's, it's a philosophy of mine, and I think we both at my company, we we assume it as well. Compliance is complex. We are not afraid Mm -hmm. of the complexity. Technology is here to harness it. Um, I, I, I'm not as big a fan of solutions that reduce complexity by simply making it less like, Oh, here's a single recipe for security for every company. That's not right. That's not good security. Um, Mm -hmm. you need to be able to harness that complexity. You need to be able to use technology, AI, intelligent systems to guide to the right type of security, to collect the appropriate validation of that security, and also to assess that the security was effectively operated. And so I do think that's where AI or intelligent systems are kind of infecting this space, like a lot of others. Uh, One thing that I'll say is important for our space is security is critical and so we we don't utilize third-party model systems to run our ai it's it's all in-house on servers that we control we don't share the data outside and so that i think is a a shift both security and the intersection of some of these third-party ai solutions that we're going to see where i think you're going to see a lot of adoption of open source tooling inside existing software Mm -hmm. platforms to deliver large language model type solutions so that you don't have to turn over all your customers' data to open AI, essentially. Uh, no, well, that's that's a, a huge concern and I've heard it addressed in a couple of different ways, but um, let's let's back up a little bit. First off, can you give me, in the context of what StrikeGraph is doing, can you give me a use case of, how, of, of where you're applying AI to your solution? Yeah. Um, I think that uh, one of the most powerful places is delivering SOC 2 audits, for example. So much of the testing of an audit uh, runs through AI tooling to check to make sure the evidence validates the practice. And that's probably the most powerful use case we can provide. What's, What's unique is that all of our, every customer is different. And so the testing has to be flexible enough. The data we've collected has to be powerful enough to handle a lot of different security practices, no matter who they are. And we think that's a lot of the value. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then you did mention that, you know, there's a concern, obviously, that um, <clears throat> if you're using something like OpenAI or ChatGPT, uh, Chat, uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT, or another LLM that's coming from, you know, whether it's AWS, Google, whoever, uh, there's a concern about whether or not they have access to your proprietary data. What I've, my understanding is typically with enterprise customers, they they don't have access to your data. There's this conception that, you know, that uh, your data is being used to train the LLM, but it's not, okay? It's from my understanding, the LLM is, they you know, it's, it's kind of frozen in time. 
um, your data can be used to impact the prompt, um, and then it, it, you know, and then in terms of the the response that's delivered to you, uh, but that's not going back to the uh, to the LLM. Um, I'm, I'm I'm intrigued though by the contrast with you know open source LLMs. Could you talk me through a little bit of that in terms of how that's more secure? Yeah. So. With an open source LLM, you have the ability to put the model on your own servers. So while I do agree that probably the enterprise solutions providers like a Microsoft is certainly or Google uh, is providing an LLM tool as an API, you're not hosting it. You know, you don't you don't have that ability to firewall where it's located. And the tricky thing here is that, and we've noticed this, is that there's a lot of nuance to the decision that, hey, we're not going to build our new LLM off your data, but we are going to, maybe we'll build it off the interaction or we, we're we going to consume utilization. Mm-hmm. It, it's a fine line. And, and I think so many CISOs and CTOs and business folks have been burned in the past mm-hmm. um, in one way or another that maybe this is a lack of trust in a way, you know, Um And so I think that's why people are sensitive. And so we definitely have enterprise tier customers that want to know what our AI architecture looks like and how we host it directly, as opposed to putting it in another place. And LLM specifically, I like to describe more as an interface, you know, like if we put an interface on the on, a, on top of a technology. So you didn't have to try and read binary. <laughs> you know, that, right. That's a lot of ways what it's doing. So in some ways it's not the LLM. It might be the date where the data goes behind that, right? Like what were they searching for? Or what was being submitted or mm-hmm. what information was you. being some provided? Of the, some of the metadata, right? No, I, I, no, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. So um, last question on, on strike graph, and then we can kind of uh, switch tracks here. And I don't know, we can talk, um, about the your future plans for Secure Talk and, and and maybe some other things because uh, earlier we touched on the breadth of security and I want to come back to that because sometimes people forget that oh my God there's like a million different rabbit holes you can go down <laughs> yeah. um, but in terms of Strike Graph just walk me through a typical engagement in terms of what's required if I, if I'm a, p- a potential customer here uh, I need I need SOC two compliance uh, some type of certification. And I know that I've got to fill out a bunch of questionnaires, possibly. I probably have to do some pen testing. I'm I'm probably going to get an auditor from Ernst & Young or something. I don't know, man. It just sounds like time-consuming and expensive. How do you you make that all less painful? Yeah. Well, um, broadly in the engagement, we do definitely want to reduce the number of vendors that our customers go out to. And so in a strike graph engagement, uh, we can provide things like <laughs> vulnerability scanning. Uh, there's not necessarily a need to um, hire a big audit firm like an Ernst & Young. Uh, we have CPAs that we work with specifically for SOC 2 or for ISO 27001 uh, with certifying bodies uh, that we can support customers with. And we're really able to streamline those relationships so you don't have the morass of vendor management that can happen quite a bit. Um, but our uh, we have a process we call it trust ops, um, which is kind mm-hmm. of operationalizing these these trust outcomes or trust assets that you want to achieve, and it's built on uh, three important pillars: uh, design, operate, and measure. And so the first thing that our customers get to do is they get to design the right security posture for their business. So we have customers that are law firms, and we have customers that are fintech trading solutions um, across the gambit. And our platform covers a swath of risks and a swath of security activities uh, that really can fit a number of different industries or types of companies. And we use intelligent technology like our risk module to help recommend the right security practices for the right business. And so our customers will really do that design work, like what is our security posture that we like. And uh, we can tell them based upon the security controls that they've activated, exactly what their gap is to any of the standards that we support on our platform. So you may get in and say, hey, this is security I'm doing today. And we might say, hey, you're 85% of the way to achieving a SOC 2 audit. 
right off the bat in the first couple of hours of joining the platform. That operate is really where StrikeGraph supports. These are our security controls. It is assigned to an owner. So you can invite your teammates on the platform and they operate that control. And then this is the evidence we're going to collect or recommend that you collect so that you can get through a formal audit. And then we get to the measure side. Measure is everything from, hey, I want a quick report out of the platform about how my risk coverage is going through to I want um, my annual ISO 27001 um, audit in uh, support of my certification or SOC 2 uh, or an internal audit function. So there's a number of different measurement activities. We like them to line up with a trust asset. So I'm trying to get my SOC 2 audit accomplished. And Mm -hmm. that's really how we full life cycle support that customer throughout that entire process. One thing I always say is that um, we are not a security solution, right? Like we don't go and build a better firewall for someone. It's not not what StrikeCraft does, but we are the the ledger and the assessment system for getting that, what is my security? Who is operating it? Did we operate it effectively? And now can do I have that diploma so I can get through procurement efficiently? Yeah. <laughs> no, I love it. I mean, you're, you're, you're quarterbacking or facilitating that whole process, um, streamlining it, simplifying it. And I'm sure that there are, are probably a couple questions that you get asked, one around pricing. I'm going to leave that off for now. But I, I, I am curious about time because I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that most of your, a lot of your customers will ask you, how long is this going to take? Yeah, it's um, there's a there's a lot of choices to be made on how long they want it to take. Um, uh, what I'll say, the, the quick answer is that we have some customers that have gotten through their first audit in as little as three to four weeks. Uh, but we have some customers that take, you know, they want to take six months. The average is 45 days uh, for a first audit for our customers. Um, the reason that you can take some decisions about how long it takes, one is, is that one of the big parts of why why we've been why our customers love us is that we have very intelligent, smart people guiding our customers. I like to say we're not just going to abandon you to our software. <laughs> and so um, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> I know there's a lot of <laughs> we've I think we've all been in that situation where <laughs> tell him what he's won, Bob. <laughs> a new path with the software. Go figure it out. That's right. <laughs> No, our customer success reps, many of them are ex-auditors themselves. And so one of the first Ooh. things that happens is you get a meeting with them and they're like, what's your roadmap look like? And, oh, you got a deal. You're trying to get over the line right away. Maybe a, a comfort letter that you're working and this is your roadmap to getting to your audit will help you get that deal over the line. But now we've drawn a line in the sand. You know, We want to get our audit in the next 60 days accomplished. Um, so there are strategies to not tightly so couple that audit accomplishment against, hey, I want to, I want to win this deal, or I have this challenge in my business right now that I'm trying to solve, and so that's part of the initial engagement. Um, but but then I think there's a decision if you peanut butter out the process a little bit, it takes less time per person over time. Uh, mm-hmm. If you try and run really hard at it, then yeah, a lot of people are gonna you know, have to lean in to implement, making sure security is implemented, collect that first round of evidence uh, of the security being implemented, and then you can get into audit. Yeah. Awesome. Wait, um, so I, I, I want to come back to, to like, how does Strike Graph tie into the Secure Talk podcast? But I, another question that just popped up because you were talking about AI and, and things like that. And I want to come back to that because, you know, you're, you're a busy executive and, and you, manage, you, you, you lead a team, right? And I just, I, I, I was attended a workshop this week on, um, you know, Microsoft Copilot. And whether it's Copilot or it's another tool, the reality is, is, it's going to be increasingly common for frontline workers to be using AI productivity based tools or enhancements, right? Um, which is super exciting for me in a, in a, in a, for a, a couple of different reasons. One is the, the ability to actually get more creative um, and do, I felt in the past I was limited. I'm not a coder um, and I wanted to do something, but I don't have that. But now if I can express myself in the appropriate way, you know, chat GPT can help me build something. Um, and it, it, it's super cool. It also can help, you know, with scheduling and, and, and meeting notes and a variety of other things. There's also some downside. I, 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 let me just ask you, though, 
from where you sit as a CEO and a leader of a team, what uh, tools are or applications are you using or in, incorporating into your kind of day to day work? Yeah. Um, for me, as a leader of the team on the day to day side, I think that um, there are uh, some AI tools that I use a fair bit. Um, I have a plug-in for like my Zoom meetings. It gets me a lot of notes and transcription out of that. That's great. I don't have to focus on that particular side of the work. Um, I know that um, we sometimes use it to help drive uh, knowledge-based articles or marketing articles where we want to get a draft together quickly. But I will say mm -hmm. that the team is a little like you have to go back and edit it. You know, you don't want what is essentially a synthesis of everyone's marketing speak. You want real right. value in the information. And so there is a, a look back and I'd say about 80% of the time it's useful and 20% of the time it it's not useful. We actually do need to start from the ground up writing it. Um, yeah. Certainly a ton of analytics. Uh, I'm not sure if that's driven by AI, but you know, Google Analytics is constantly trying to improve, you know, some of the information that we can get out of website traffic and information around that. And then there's a fair bit of like um, sales enablement tools that are driving towards uh, more intelligent systems, honestly, whether that's hunting a finer tune lead opportunity or contact that you want to go out and chat with. Um, I think those are the other areas where we're just seeing it impact the business. Now, on the, I kind of segment like what are some operational things that we're doing to go to market or, um, or like knowledge base or training internally from how do we develop intellectual property? And so we did write a policy internally about our intellectual property development and what tools we can use to generate code or not generate code. Um, and I think we found out that the developers are a little unleashed. They certainly have a fair bit of tools that they can use to make their work more efficient or, you know, mm -hmm. not, not have to do the, the boring stuff so much. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, we did look at a lot of the licensing uh, information around some of the, the tools that do AI coding for you and the ones that we were comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, you're looking at it from a couple, uh, several different angles there. Uh, and uh, it's I, I, it's kind of fun because we're all trying to figure it out uh, as we go. And uh, the pace is accelerating. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, it's interesting times, definitely not boring. Um, well, let's let's jump now over uh, to Secure Talk because, like, how does that fit into the Stripe graph, you know, um, game plan well um hopefully to uh, ease your listeners concern uh, we won't talk about strike graph all the time i promise <laughs> as a matter of fact <laughs> we really uh, want to continue the great work you've done mark and allow secure talk as to be valuable on its own inherently and so um uh, certainly i think my interest in the space my opportunity to learn i'm going to try and continue you know what you've given us here what you've uh, founded and developed uh, so StrikeGraph won't be the discussion 99% uh, of the time, uh, other than our general experience. We, we really just want the, the content itself to stand as a valuable part of the conversation and the community and what we're doing and, and an opportunity for me to grow as well. Um, I think that uh, we really, I think what one thing you've done and we want to continue that is continue to make security an approachable conversation, right? Like, me personally, I, I've had to learn a lot about this space coming from that CTO role and operational role into, you know, uh, an expertise around security, security practices. And of course, um, for my work compliance and security compliance. Um, and, uh, and so that's a really important thread we're going to continue to pull forward. Um, we uh, are going to continue to really bring you know, guests that help enunciate how this landscape is shifting and where to kind of focus on what's important. Um, we'll continue to talk to critical innovators uh, in the security space, people that are developing security solutions or security practices or security leadership. You know, we, we want to talk with those innovators and what they're seeing. Um, 
we're uh, we're also kind of interested in in kind of reviewing and analyzing some major incidents that happen from time to time, whether it be intellectual property theft, uh, cybersecurity crime, um, things like that. And so I we're we're looking at some potential episodes in the future where we may bring in some experts that have analyzed some of these outcomes and talk about what happened. And uh, I think at the end of the day. Um, we find those to be really intriguing stories. And so we want to continue to provide intriguing stories uh, about what's happening in, in this space. Um, and then broadly, we really want to bring on people that can close out a conversation with what's the future of security and how do I stay informed and prepared and really future-proof some of my organizations or our practices. It's staying one step ahead is, I think, a part of this game, you know, and uh, and so we'll try and bring in those leaders that can help us have a dialogue about what that future looks like and what to be aware of and how it might impact an industry or business that people are leading. Yeah. I mean, all that sounds very, very super cool. And and one of the things that I that I like is that you're coming at this from a similar angle that I um, started Secure Talk from, which was, you know, we're not, we weren't selling a particular technology or tool and that we had to kind of firewall secure talk off from all the other similar pr- solutions out there. Um, we talked to everybody yeah. and because and, we were a Microsoft partner and we, we, we were selling more services, um, but we'd even talk to other service providers, other, you know, uh, managed service providers and so on, because they're coming at it from different angle. Maybe they're looking at different solutions. And I gotta say though, like, there were so many times because I thought like, okay, I understand security in the context of what Microsoft is doing. Um, but you, you, you start talking to these CEOs or leaders from, from organizations of solutions or tools or services that you have never heard of. And you've got to, you've got to kind of research or prepare for the meeting and they're in there and they're, because they're doing this stuff 24 um, seven. They assume that everybody speaks that same language yeah. and there was, <laughs> but that's, but that's where that, that, that learning comes in. And I'm like, wow, never thought about it from, from, from this perspective. Um, and then, you know, it's funny because some of the most popular guests we've had on have been people like Nathan house, uh, who who is one of the leading online uh, security educators and ethical hacking uh, instructors? I mean, he's had literally millions of students um, go through his programs, yeah. and a, a couple other educators that come through as well. Some of them do virtual, like Wiser. Um, so it's it's interesting. I think the the idea though uh, of taking an incident and kind of, uh, you know, analyzing what went wrong, how was the response and all that is super, super uh, important and helpful because it's it's just kind of like reading a white paper or a case study and saying, hey, you know, how would we handle this? Because a lot of times if you get, if you haven't thought about this stuff in advance and then you get hit with it, I don't care what it is, cybersecurity, anything else, if you're just scrambling to respond, good luck. Yeah. But if you've thought through and get the lessons learned, I don't know if you've ever go to the ISSA meetings. Um, yes, I joined a couple yes. of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, I don't know if the, the chapter head for many years was Justin White, and uh, I'm down here in Bellevue. They would have the monthly meetings over in Mercer Island at the community center. Amazing. Yeah. Literally, there would typically be anywhere from 40 to 60, 70 people. And Justin, when he was leading, would always start off with um, a session, just kind of like a, a the month in review, and take some incidences. And by the way, Justin, Justin, you guys definitely should know. <laughs> <Yeah. you. laughs> but uh, he would do this month in review and then you would learn so much, man. I mean, I, 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 it was four years ago, I think, when he went through the Equifax breach yeah. and all the missteps that were made there. And it's still right here. I didn't study it. It was just it just was presented there. And we were, and it was kind of in this kind of conversational manner. And then they typically have a, a speaker that will come in not promoting their solution, but just talking about what they're seeing. So, um, yeah, I think your idea to do, do all that is, is, is awesome. And uh, I'm going to be a listener, man. So, Mark, uh, what is next for you? Like, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're often working on. Well, well thanks for asking. Yeah, so I, um, I have been working with, as I mentioned earlier, a company called MemoQ, which uh, is a SaaS platform for the translation localization industry. And they, I, I was working with them to help expand their footprint in the regulated industries and also got roped into a couple of different strategic projects. One of them was helping them to optimize their RFP response process. Most organizations 
many organizations don't have a defined process. They don't have um, specific tools that they use. So what happens is an RFP will come in, um, you know, one of these complex questionnaires could be 30, 40, 50, 100 pages long, and it requires input from maybe your uh, HR team, your finance team, your security team, your product team, uh, your uh, the uh, GSE team. And so what happens is, is your BDM has to run around and try to collect all this information from all these different you know, subject matter experts. And then two weeks later or a month later, another questionnaire comes in, another RFP comes in, and they have to kind of duplicate that process. So we, we optimized our process, but we also started to use some of our uh, database technology to kind of store the previously used responses and then reuse them either with an exact match or what we call like a fuzzy match. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked extremely well. We decided, hey, you know what, maybe we can productize this. So yeah. we did some market research, found there is a market. Um, we, we're, we're, we're not looking to do everything in the market. We have some uh, strengths that we've identified. And uh, so that, MemoQ decided to create a new entity, invested a couple million dollars in MemoQ RFP, which is a U.S.-based entity, completely separate from the parent company. Um, I shouldn't even say parent company, separate, completely separate from the, 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 the investment entity. And they asked me to take over as a CEO and co-founder. So right now, what I'm doing is uh, everything, as you know, as a CEO of a startup, yeah. <laughs> just running in many different directions as one, at, at once. Uh, but we're working on our MVP, which should be out early next year. We already have 15 beta customers signed up. And it's a problem that it's so funny because once we announced this, I mean, I had so many people contact me. They're like, help us, help us. And I'm like, I, I'm going to, but you got to wait for MVP. You know? So. <laughs> Um, but but pr pretty exciting. That same technology can be used to respond to RFIs, security questionnaires, by the way, mm -hmm. um, and, and many other kind of these business questionnaire type documents. So we think there's a huge market there, great potential, and uh, super excited to get our MVP out there and uh, start getting feedback. Uh, always a big celebrator of a founder journey, Mark. It sounds very exciting. A lot of type two fun, um, but uh, uh rooting you on to big success. And of course, we'll have you come back and be a guest sometime in the future. That would be awesome. Well, hey, uh, Justin, you know, I, again, I appreciate you and your support with Secure Talk in the past and uh, as coming on as a guest. And I again, really appreciate you taking the uh, the lead with Secure Talk now, taking over the ownership. And uh, I, I wish you and the rest of your team at StrikeGraph and the people who you're working with on Secure Talk is just the uh, the greatest of success. I think you've really set us up for that, Mark. Um, and uh, I, I'm really excited. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So thank you. 